Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. I'm so excited to kick off this live webinar on Are You Ready for GDPR? GDPR is a very hot topic these days and definitely for good reason. I'm excited to have two special guests joining us today. The first is Michelle. Michelle Miles is the VP of Consulting Services at Percuto. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tara. Next up, we have Peter. Peter will be joining us for the Q&A section later on in the webinar. Peter Bell is the Senior Director of EMEA Marketing at Marketo. Hello, and uh, thank you for making the time this afternoon, or this morning, depending on uh, your location. And I'm Tara Robertson, Director of Revenue Marketing at Uberflip, and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started, just some quick housekeeping items. First of all, yes, this is being recorded. We will be emailing you a copy of the recording later today, so feel free to share that with any colleagues who couldn't join us live. And of course, we have a hashtag. Feel free to, to join us on Uber Webinar and share any learnings you have or any additional questions for our panelists. And just a quick word about Uberflip, your host today. Uberflip is a content marketing platform and we empower B2B marketers to create re remarkable content experiences at scale. So any content experiences from your blog, lead generation, ABM, sales enablement, pretty much any type of content experience, we can help you personalize it at scale for your prospects and customers. And of course we integrate with Marketo and Percuto is a great partner of ours as well. Just a quick agenda for today. So Michelle will be taking us through some GDPR basics, as well as how to prepare for GDPR. And then we'll be moving on to a fairly lengthy Q&A session because we got some great questions ahead of the webinar. Michelle, again to introduce you. So Michelle Miles is the VP of Consulting Services at Percuto, and she is a Marketo Certified Solutions Architect. Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Tara. Uh, so Percuto is a marketing automation consulting firm headquartered in Montreal. Uh, we help marketing leaders who feel frustrated with not having a bigger impact on revenue. We have employees all across North America and more than 200 clients. Uh, so that's a bit about a background on us. Uh, I am leading the GDPR readiness programs for Percuto, and as I work with more and more organizations, it's really apparent how confusing the requirements of GDPR are and how intricate preparations are for your systems and for teams. So I wanted to start today with a quick poll to get your understanding of GDPR. And while you're doing the poll, uh, I wanted to note that today we're going to be covering what GDPR is, what it means for your organization, and how it impacts your marketing communications. All of the materials that I covered today can be found on our website, learn.perquito.com slash GDPR. All right, it looks like we have some results. I see I'm not completely alone with GDPR creeping into my dreams. All right, thank you. Okay, GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation, is consent-driven legislation. The goal is to give data back, control of data back to the individual, and the individual can then give permission to collect their data or not. GDPR requires transparency in data usage. This means detailing how data will be stored and used, and if you're enriching it with third-party data. It regulates how you collect and store data, so the main thing to remember is the individual controls his or her own data. They can request a data export to transfer their information to another company, or even request to completely remove their data from all databases. Finally, should your company get hacked or experience a data breach, you must promptly notify your users. So all of this places some serious responsibility on organizations. So how does a company know the extent of GDPR on their operations? I would recommend starting with a database assessment. You'll want to identify first, any records that are missing normalized country data, the number of EU records you have, the viability and engagement level of those records, and if those records have GDPR compliant consent, and if you have the documentation to back it up. This will help you assess the magnitude of the problem for your company and quantify the cost should you have to delete those records. This will help if you need to build a case to allocate the required resources for the project in front of you. No one wants to be fined 20 million euros or stop marketing operations in Europe. 
Your database is key, especially when it comes to email marketing. But remember, GDPR is not just for email. GDPR applies to all personal data, even simply storing personal data in your database. This does apply to B2B information. Personal data means any information that makes it a person, an individual personally identifiable. So this can be as simple as an email address. Keep in mind, GDPR is consent driven and email consent can constitute data consent if appropriate privacy policies are acknowledged. You'll wanna be sure to tra track data consent as you would email consent. So as you can tell, and from the questions received, consent under GDPR is not quite as simple as it sounds. So let's dive into that. There's a lot of confusion and discussion around regarding the topic of consent. So what's important to know and what should you absolutely avoid? Under GDPR, you must have explicit consent to retain personal data and the documentation to back it up. So I would recommend recording the opt-in date and opt-in source. Remember, remember that GDPR stipulates that you cannot keep records longer than absolutely necessary. So having that opt-in date will help you identify the age of each record. If you're unsure if you have appropriate consent on your records, you'll want to spend some time segmenting your database to evaluate if those records are compliant or not. So how do you do this? Uh, consider a few different things. First, the lead source, the opt-in date, and continued engagement or relationship with the lead, and whether or not all data use was explained and acknowledged at the time of consent. If you're in doubt, I would suggest running a whitelisting campaign now or an opt-in campaign, uh, so that way there's no question regarding how or when consent was obtained. Remember too that no marketing campaign has a 100% response rate, so your whitelisting campaign will take several efforts. You'll wanna make sure you plan ahead to wrap up your efforts by that May 25th deadline. And so the whitelisting campaign can be sent to anyone who meets current EU directive legislations. To clarify who that would be, that would be your opt-in records with insufficient documentation, form submissions and trade show badge scans, and anyone with an existing business relationship. So moving on uh, to another hot topic, one that's near and dear to all of us, using content assets to obtain consent. We all love offering a white paper or ebook to collect our user information and score the lead. But the big question is, can we still do this once GDPR goes into effect? Absolutely, you just can't buy consent. So you can't make consent a requirement to download the content, but you can include consent option on your form, such as an unchecked checkbox. Be sure you have the consent acknowledged in your privacy policy. It needs to be clear that opting in to receive marketing content is not required to download the content asset. There's a big discussion on this right now in the Marketo community. Uh, let's take a look at the sample form. So here you'll note that we're collecting country data. The consent checkbox is present, but it's unchecked and it's not required to submit the form. This form also provides an extra layer of reinsurance that the data will be secured and links to the privacy policy. You'll see the language under the opt-in there where it says opting in for information is not required to receive the content. It just makes it very clear. Okay, we're all concerned about the data declarations to be GDPR compliant and we wanna avoid bogging down our forms. So to do this, move the legalese to your privacy policy that keeps your forms response oriented and nice and clean. Your privacy policy needs to state how data will be used, any enhancements, and what for what purpose, how long you'll keep the records, and how to withdraw consent. GDPR states that withdrawing consent must be as easy as giving it. So you can't hide it, bury it, or disguise it in legalese, sorry. We've included an example here for sample privacy policy language, but you'll wanna be sure to discuss your specific policy with your legal team. So as we talk about consent, one of the more commonly asked questions is around the topic of legitimate interest and marketers wondering if they can use legitimate interest instead of obtaining consent. It's a valid question, but it's also an area where you need to proceed with caution. GDPR has spelled out where you can use legitimate interest and many marketers think item A or E applies. After all, you have a legitimate interest in selling your product and moving your customer towards signing a contract. But unfortunately, there's no shortcut to GDPR compliance. Think about it. GDPR includes 99 articles, all with the goal of protecting an individual's privacy and rights to personal data. So if you're going to use legitimate interest, you must conduct a legitimate interest assessment, comply with all other requirements for data protection, usage, and storage, 
and document a balance of interests, both your own and the person receiving com your communications. Keep in mind that legitimate interest may apply only to storing and processing data for a contract and not to your marketing efforts. So when can you claim legitimate interest? Let's look at a hypothetical situation. Let's say you're ordering pizza online. Rather than create an account, you opt to check out as a guest and only provide the necessary information to get your pepperoni pizza delivered to your doorstep. In this case, you've provided your name and delivery address plus your payment information. Does the pizza place have a legitimate interest to process your data? Absolutely. Can they continue to communicate with you and send you pizza promotions for future orders? No, they don't have your consent. Legitimate interest in this example only applies to processing your order. It's not permission to use your information for any other purpose. So if the pizza place started sending me special promotions, sold my data to another company, or began tracking my pizza purchases for their rewards program, they would be using my data in ways that I would not reasonably expect as a guest, and that would have more than a minimal impact on my privacy. In other words, Pizza Place is in violation of GDPR. Legitimate interest is very much a legal gray zone, and you're likely to hear both conservative and broad legal opinions on the topic. The UK ICO, the uh, Information Commissioner's Office, sums it up saying, legitimate interest is likely to be the most appropriate where you use the people's data in ways they would reasonably expect and which have minimal privacy impact, or where there's a compelling justification for the processing. So the bottom line, if you use customers' data in an unexpected way, or a way that goes beyond your initial reason for gaining access to it, you could be in violation of GDPR. Moving from pizza to cookies. With Marketo, we love our cookies, and we can still use cookies if we have explicit permission you'll most likely need to change your settings that loads Munchkin code because this is a departure from the current do not track legislation. This means all those messages you've seen saying by using the site you agree to cookies that imply approval no longer comply. We've mocked up another marketing example for you, but I'm sure you can get creative too. This is an example of a complete site takeover. It appears within a few seconds of the user entering your site. You can see the darkened site behind the message and clearly the visitor must take action before continuing. The messaging here is more friendly and human. It still declares the cookie usage, but in a less threatening way. Explaining why we use the cookies may help capture that consent. The downside is that if the no button is clicked, you must disable your cookies. Unfortunately, that's your only legal option. Some of you likely have questions about what marketing communications you can and not, cannot send come May 25th, so I wanted to go through a few of them. Opt-in messages and double opt-in messages. You can still send opt-in confirmations and Germany requires double opt-in, but no marketing communications until you have consent. Purchase confirmation emails. There's no problem here either. Those are transactional, so they're okay under the GDPR legitimate interest. Now a trickier one, SDR, BDR emails. The answer is yes, you can send them if the prospect has reached out to you requesting more information or if you have marketing consent. What won't fly is cold calling to prospects. And just a reminder, we've put together a free ebook. It's called GDPR FAQ Legal Questions Straightforward Answers. The ebook translates GDPR legalese and puts some answers to more of the commonly asked questions, particularly around what communications are permissible. And it's free and available to all attendees um, using the link on your screen, learn.procuto.com slash GDPR. So what's the impact of GDPR on your systems? Let's talk about data enrichment and lead scoring. First, these activities require transparency and user consent. So put this information in your privacy policy. And keep in mind, any third-party data processors must also be GDPR compliant. We'll get back to that in a minute. You also need to think about the GDPR impact of your current systems. Continuing with these examples, you'll want to review when data enrichment occurs, so you're not paying to enhance leads you may not have the permission to retain in your database once you've fulfilled a short-term request, such as a white paper. Second, lead scoring is greatly impacted for EU leads. Since cookies now require explicit consent, it's likely you won't have a lot of web behavioral data to score off of initially. So you'll need to revisit your scoring strategies and thresholds for EU leads and ensure you're still passing those leads on to sales. 
Okay, so an area often overlooked is your MarTech stack. GDPR stipulates that if you're the one deciding what data to collect and how to use it, then you're what GDPR calls the data controller. But all the technologies in your MarTech stack, Marketo, Uberflip, Salesforce, Visible, as well as any agencies or service providers who access your data, those are considered to be data processors. This includes all of your external systems, companies, agencies, service providers or contractors, anyone who's enriching your data, collecting your data on your behalf, mining, segmenting or analyzing records, or even handling payroll or other outsourced HR activities. Those are all data processors. And guess what? GDPR says that each one must be compliant. And there's more. As a data controller, you are responsible for ensuring that your data processors are GDPR compliant. You've probably seen some information distributed by Marketo and Salesforce regarding their compliance status already. Additionally, we have a questionnaire on our website to start the documentation process for your data processors if you're interested. Lastly, GDPR requires that all data controllers and processors hire a data protection officer if you meet certain conditions, and those include if you're processing vast amounts of data, if you're using online behavioral tracking, such as scoring, or if you're a public authority. A, D a DPO, data protection officer, advises you of compliance requirements, they monitor ongoing compliance, and they conduct data protection impact assessments, DPIAs, and act as a liaison with the GDPR supervisory authorities. Your DPO can be a member of your staff, or you can have an outsourced or even a shared DPO. The main thing to consider is that you have enough access to your DPO for them to effectively advise you. So wrapping up, GDPR is all about giving control of personal data back to the individual. So to be compliant with GDPR, you have to be able to honor a number of their requests, including the right to request an export of all their personal data, perhaps to transfer to another company, the right to be informed how data will be used, the right to be notified of a data breach within 72 hours, and the right to be completely removed from all of your databases. You guys have probably heard quite a bit about that right to erasure. GDPR is massive and difficult to understand. Though it's a tedious process requiring many adjustments, I believe that we'll ultimately gain more user trust and engagement in the long run. My advice, keep educating yourself, get through these next couple of months of compliance headaches, and resume your focus on creating compelling content and engaging conversations. Nobody signs up to be on a sales list. But customers do subscribe to valuable, meaningful, and relevant information, and they're willing to provide their personal information and consent in exchange for it. Your marketing can thrive in a GDPR world. So for more information, you can visit learn.burkito.com slash GDPR. You'll find the ebook I mentioned on the FAQs as well as the Marketo Client's Guide to GDPR Compliance. Um, I'll also be speaking at Marketo Summit if you're attending. I, my session is called Fearless Marketing in a GDPR World, Tips to Thrive and Mis Admits New Regulations. And Peter, who's also on the call today, will also be speaking. And finally, Perkito does offer GDPR readiness programs with assessments and implementations. If you'd like more information, you can email success at perkito.com. And that concludes my presentation. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Tara. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was so educational. So much to take away from that. And again, I'll remind everyone we are sharing the recording and the slides later today. So don't worry if you didn't jot all of that down. There was a lot to take away there. Um, and I love dropping it up on that optimistic note. I definitely agree that it's not necessarily a cause for concern. It's definitely going to push marketers to be a little bit more creative, if anything. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. So people will always opt into great content that's relevant to them. Now let's head into our Q&A. So I think I mentioned this earlier, but we did get a lot of great questions ahead of the webinar. I've seen probably a dozen come in live while Michelle was going through her section. So we'll see if we can get to those, but we'll start with the questions that we got ahead of time. Um, and again, all of these questions are going to be answered by Michelle and also by Peter, who is the Senior Director of EME EA Marketing at Marketo. So first question, um, this one's from Lisa. And I think this would be a great one for you, Peter. Her question is, can we market to existing contacts who fall into the EU or do we need to do an opt-in campaign? So Michelle covered this pretty quickly, but Peter, do you have any tips on kind of doing that re-opt-in campaign for EU contacts? I do. And again, like a lot of the, a lot of uh, the discussion so far, 
um, all of this is open to legal interpretation by your own legal team. So it's worth uh, on any of these points uh, checking back with your own uh, legal folks who may have a different view. Of course. Um, but you know, to answer your question, um, I would say only if you've got a record of where, when, uh, and what consent was given for. Um, if you've been keeping good, if you've, if you've if good record keeping in the past, and you can see where consent was given, then I don't see why you should stop marketing to them. Now, very few of us have records which go as far as GDPR is asking to, particularly in the area of being specific. Uh, a lot of the consent we've gathered has uh, has been broad based as we've touched upon. Download a piece of content and you're opted in uh, to communication. So it may be you do want to look at legitimate interest. Um, again, this has been covered. Uh, it does make specific reference in the legislation uh, to the use of legitimate interest for direct marketing purposes. So there is specific reference to it and has been mentioned before is a gray area um, and this is definitely one to get round the table with your lawyers on. Has your record keeping been sufficient in the past to carry you forward in GDPR world after May 25th? Uh, are you going to use legitimate interest um, as part of your strategy? Uh, and then what do you need to do? Do you need to re-opt in people or can, can you continue to market? And if you can answer those questions between the marketing team and the legal team, then you're a good place to understand uh, where, you, where you are. Great. I think that clarifies things. Um, Michelle, this is a question from Pete. Um, Pete is asking, what if we're not completely ready by the GDPR date? And again, that date is May 25th. Sure. Uh, GDPR was passed two years ago, so there isn't a further grace period. However, you can prioritize which efforts you want to do first. So the efforts I would personally prioritize would include a cookie management solution, a robust privacy policy, and that whitelisting campaign to opt people in. Uh, then if you need to include a simple email address to manually process some of those GDPR rights requests, so be it. You can build out a more automated campaign after the deadline as long as you're honoring those specific requests. You could also minimize your risk by refraining to market to any EU leads until you're more compliant. That's great advice. Um, question for you, Peter. If I market only in the US, what are my requirements and have they changed? Um, in a word, if you're only uh, marketing to uh, US citizens, you have no international customers or international um, contacts within those customers. So if you have a global client who employs people globally, including the EU, then those contacts would fall under EU legislation. You would be impacted. But if you genuinely only have North American customers who do not have employees based in or, um, the European Union, then arguably nothing changes. Um, I'd pause for reflection though, uh, because if you step back from the mechanics of GDPR um, and you think about what it's asking us to do, actually what it's asking us to do is communicate to the right person at the right time with the right message. And that sounds like good marketing to me. Um, and from all of us, it's an opportunity to raise the bar on some of the execution. You know, an irrelevant and unsolicited email is never going to convert. It may, may make us feel good because we can point to, I sent this many emails or I've got this many contacts in the database. But the reality is it's only going to lower our conversion metrics uh, if we're not uh, communicating effectively with them. So look, even if you do fall into that small minority of folks who, who are not impacted by this in a legal way, step back and think about all your competitors who may be operating in, uh, in the European Union as well. They'll be raising the quality bar. Uh, I'd take the opportunity to do the same, quite frankly, as a marketer. That's great advice. Another thing I would caution, I've seen this question a lot from American companies, and a lot of the time Canada gets lumped in um, at, with North American lists and everything. So be careful with that, because in Canada, we do have Castle, which is a whole other bag of worms. Um, not quite as complicated as GDPR, but I would definitely read up on Castle Canadian anti-spam legislation as well, just to make sure that you're compliant. Um, another question for you, Michelle. You covered this a little bit on the um, opt-in side, but what other type of documentation is required to show compliance? Uh, that's a good question. So as a controller, 
Specific to your marketing team, I, I would recommend that your marketing team work with legal on several things. Uh, your privacy policy, your website terms and conditions, and your cookie policy. You're going to want to talk to them and IT about a data protection plan or some kind of security architecture documentation. As a marketing team, you'll very much need a data processing record keeping plan illustrating how you're using and processing the data. Uh, you'll also want to be prepared with a security breach action plan or incident response plan. You don't want to wait for an incident to happen and then realize you have 72 hours to figure out what you're going to do about it, who's doing what, and how to communicate it. Uh, another big piece of this is a data protection impact assessment. I would assume that marketers are going to get very familiar with doing those as they handle large mailing lists in particular. And if you're going to be doing um, any legitimate interest claims, you'll want to do that legitimate interest assessment. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as discussed, you're also going to need to be sure that you get proof of processor compliance. Great. That's quite a checklist already. <laughs> um, Peter, this ties back to your point around sending the right marketing to the right people at the right time. Um, but this question is, as I understood it, B2B communications don't require double opt-ins if the email address is a work email. Um, they simply need to ensure that there is an opt-out. Can you confirm or clarify this point? Yeah, I think this is a good point to clarify because uh, certainly when I first heard people speaking on GDPR, um, double opt-in got mentioned a lot. And mm -hmm. I think it became one of those urban myths that once one person said it uh, <laughs> and someone repeated it, then it must be the true. Um, and GDPR does not state that you have to use double opt-in. Um, in fact, GDPR, in like all European Union legislation, doesn't stipulate the method of how you need to comply. It states what you need to comply with. How you choose to comply with it is left open to your interpretation, which I speak as a European. I know that can be very, very frustrating to uh, North American citizens, um, you know, where legislation is written very differently. Uh, but European Union, uh, European legislation uh, typically leaves that interpretation open to you. Um, so the mechanism, to be clear, is not described by the legislation. Um, and the choice to use double opt-in uh, may be dictated by certain geographies. Certainly Germany, which was mentioned earlier, uh, does require double opt-in, um, but other European countries don't. Um, I see it as I'm not an expert on Castle, but I believe uh, double opt-in is pretty pervasive in Canada these days. Um, again, perhaps you could clarify on that because I'm uh, not as familiar with Castle. It's but not required the main thing, for Castle. It's not required. Okay, thank you. Um, the you need to work through again with the legal team. Okay, how uh, you know? Am I gathering consent? Uh, is it clear? Am I being transparent in the usage? Am I upholding those six principles of GDPR when I'm capturing consent? Typically, that affects your landing page design, uh, your privacy statement uh, wording, and things like that. Um, and thereafter, the exact implementation is is your choice. But you don't have to do a double opt-in. Great, that's very helpful. Michelle, a question from JP. So this is going back to that example of the form that you had earlier in your deck. Um, what are some other examples of wording you can use on your forms to ask for consent? And also, do we need to have the privacy policy linked right there on the form or can it be further down on the page? I've seen a lot of people kind of stick them in the footer of their landing pages. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first I would have a subscription center landing page with your form that really speaks to the benefits and the values of receiving your communication and why they would want that communication, the old what's in it for me, uh, and really highlight the types of things they're going to receive. So then related to that, your form language could be, you know, I'd like to receive more information or um, more email communications on webinars, research, et cetera, et cetera, of the methods of uh, communication trade shows or whatnot uh, on topic. And then I like to have a, I understand and agree to the privacy policy and link the privacy policy right there. That is not required precisely for GDPR. As Peter said, um, it's not that prescriptive on exactly how you have to get consent, but somehow you do have to obtain data processing consent. And I think it would be difficult to do that without referencing a privacy policy or a data handling policy. So in my mind, you might as well link to it. Um, I do think it is simpler to have the privacy policy and agreed 
and agreeing to that with the email consent checkbox as opposed to having two separate checkboxes, one with consent for data processing and the privacy policy elsewhere, and then another for email consent. Uh, so I would say the best practice would be to just have a very simple statement with, I understand and agree to the privacy policy with the email consent, explaining all of the data consent as well. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this is probably one that we could all chime in on, but it's specific to webinars, so a little meta. Um, so Hunter's question is, if someone registers for a webinar, maybe send them reminder emails about the upcoming webinar and an accompanying archive. Do we need to disclose this on the registration form? So this ties into implied interest again, which comes up a lot. I'm not sure you'd like to go first. So to prevent the stagnant pause, I shall jump in. Um, <laughs> It, it, I think this is the same as the earlier example with a content asset. Uh, we've all gotten used to capturing new names through uh, content assets and syndication or uh, perhaps webinars where this is our opportunity to convert that unknown lead into a known lead. And um, going forward, uh, GDPR asks that we be more specific in what we are asking people to consent to, and we'd be explicit about what we're going to, how, how and where we're going to use that data. So I think we'll see, whether it be a webinar or a content asset, we'll see that uh, instances of landing pages, for instance, the registration for a webinar, um, have a checkbox there, which is um, offering the choice of opting into just this event, or into associated marketing materials. Um, within Marketo, this is we've documented how to do this um, in our practical guide, which is up on our website. Um, but you, we, we will certainly move to, in all probability, to a situation on our own landing pages where um, if you're opting into a webinar, um, then you'll be opting into the webinar, uh, and more general consent will require a second affirmative action, such as checking a box. That's the method we would employ as well. Uh, I would remind folks that you do have a time limit on how long you can retain and market to data. So if someone uh, does not opt in beyond that specific event, you, you can't keep that data forever. You can process it throughout the webinar. You can send the operational communications. You can send the recording afterwards. When you send the uh, recording, maybe you want to have a call to action in there, uh, inviting people to opt into more events at that time. But if no one responds to that within a week or so, um, you would have to remove that data because you have limited rights to it. Right, and sending that along with the recording is the perfect time to ask for that opt-in to more resources versus just, again, what, what a lot of marketers are doing now is just assuming they want to hear more from you. So really enforcing that opt-in. Um, Peter, another Marketo-specific question for you. How do I set up Munchkin so it only fires after I get consent? Okay, so um, for those who are not familiar with what Munchkin is, um, Munchkin is the cookie that we use for tracking, for behavioral tracking. Uh, it isn't associated with email link tracking. Um, it does two things. Uh, uh, once you've got Munchkin on your website, um, it tracks uh, web page visits and click links. And there are three ways to deal with this. Uh, the first is obviously um, you should upfront on your website anyway, have a cookie notice, uh, which should include a link to your privacy policy. Um, notifying uh, the visitor that you uh, employ the use of cookies. Um, I'm going to come back to this point in a moment because, uh, because there's a secondary piece of legislation which is worth mentioning. Um, but just for clarity, uh, once you've employed that notice and you have our cookie tracking, which is Munchkin, um, there are three ways that you can give control to the visitor uh, to choose to opt out of this uh, if they don't want to be behavioral tracked by Marketo. One is, um, if you're a Marketo admin, um, you, it's probably worth turning on do not track. Um, you should do that just as a matter of good practice. Uh, this will mean that if the visitor has turned on do not track in their browser, um, this is probably less than 5% of all web uh, users, uh, then it's right to honor that. And they've basically said, wherever I go on the internet, I would prefer not to be tracked. Um, so do turn on do not track. We do support it, but it isn't turned on by default. Um, 
Second, uh, you should have a link uh, to your privacy page. Um, to the earlier conversation, I would not advocate burying it. I would have it in prominent places and landing pages, and it should be present in your standard footer across your website um, and in any cookie notices so that people can click through to the privacy notice. And at that point, I would offer a button uh, which would, when pressed, uh, drop the Marketo do not track cookie. I know there's an irony here that we have to drop a cookie in order to stop cookie tracking, uh, but uh, we, that's how the technology works. Um, and that would opt them out of the Marketo cookie tracking. Uh, if you want, if you have a more sophisticated cookie tracking uh, and cookie management solution in place, then all of this can ac be accessed via API. Uh, so if you invested in a cookie management platform, uh, then this you can do this programmatically through our APIs. I would advocate investing in a cookie management platform um, now, even uh, for one simple reason. There is a related piece of GDP of legislation from the European Union which um, is behind schedule now. Uh, it was supposed to come into force at the same time as GDPR on May 25th, and it's called the e-privacy directive. Um, in brief, GDPR. Um, asks as many questions as it answers about the use of cookies and tracking. The e-privacy directive will complete the picture um, and it will change the way that we are all able to use cookies. It's likely cookies will be classified into different types. It'd be likely that there'll be further legislation and we all need to respond to that. The best way you can prepare for what is the unknown, because this, this legislation is not even out of draft yet, um, is to invest in a cookie management platform uh, where they have uh, a clear handle on GDPR and the e-privacy directive going forward, which puts you on a front foot uh, for when this does become uh, law. If I could add to that, uh, I would also recommend the cookie management platform. That's something we're recommending for our clients. As we've done a number of GDPR assessments, I think our clients are finding that they're surprised how many cookies are on their site. Many of them have 100 or more cookies on their site, which sounds pretty shocking. And if you try to attack those on a one-off basis, I think it gets very unwieldy. Uh, however, if you do want more information on Munchkin specifically, uh, there's some good resources on the Marketo development site as well that detail some of the different parameters and how you can load Munchkin code. One more question for you, Michelle. How does This is actually one I've been quite wondering as well. Um, how does the right of erasure impact the maintenance of a do not email list? So if you have to purge the contact, don't you run the risk of acquiring them again and accidentally emailing them without the history of that suppression? Uh, sure. So I would recommend having some kind of landing page where people can exercise their various rights and then having a systematic program as opposed to leaving things up to a, a customer service type of person that doesn't have some background here. Uh, so I would set up an auto response email first that ensures that erasure to the erasure requests and explain first what site functionality or services they lose if you don't have their information offer an unsubscribe as an alternative. And then when you do that in that email, you can also note that because of their erasure request, they could re-enter the database without a suppression request at some point in time and receive communication. So in that automated email, I would offer a link or a button or whatever to stop the erasure request and then uh, unsubscribe instead. And you can build out flows for that in Marketo and, uh, and, and stop and send an alert to the person doing the actual erasure so they know not to proceed and not to notify others of erasure. Um, keep in mind that when you erase, erase someone from a database, you don't just have to erase them from Marketo, for example, uh, and your CRM, but any other system where they are. Uh, so if accounting has a record, uh, anything else, that you don't have a very strong, compelling, legitimate interest like another um, legal obligation, uh, say accounting has to have the record for tax purposes, et cetera, um, you'll need to follow through with that. So it's not just clicking that um, you know, delete flow in Marketo. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you would need to notify others company-wide. Uh, so I think it is appropriate to notify people of their different options and give them more of that control. And then with that, you know, you can say that um, all data will be erased when thir within 30 days throughout the company. So you would have a little time for them to take the unsubscribe option if they prefer. Okay, interesting. I'll have to look into sending and, that email. <laughs> and just uh, 
and this is a complex topic, so I would uh, add that it ultimately it's up to your discretion interpretation. But if you're a marketer user and you um, are employing the durable unsubscribe list, um, we do keep a minimum amount of information to facilitate the customer's compliance request. Um, we basically keep, um, I think it's the, the email address and the date are the only two fields which are retained. Um, we have looked at this and um, there is provision as was touched on a moment ago that uh, the right be forgotten that shall not apply to the extent that processing is necessary. Um, so in terms of our ability to comply with um, a, a customer's request, uh, there is reference to uh, the fact that some data can be, re be retained to uh, honor that. Um, even where the right to be forgotten is also, you know, is in place. So it, it's a complex area. Your legal team ultimately will have final discretion on this. Uh, but if you are using the durable and subscribe list, it's certainly worth a, a review. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, one question that came up while you were both speaking about cookie management. Um, someone is asking if you are able to recommend any cookie management platforms for them to look into. Uh, Percuto currently has a service offering for implementation and we are partnering with the cookie management platform and integrating it with Marketo. Uh, if you're interested in that, it could be, you could email success at Percuto.com. Our partner is OneTrust. Great, OneTrust. Um, another question that just came up is we have a customer portal with a login to access it. Once they enter, would this be covered by GDPR or would we need to have them opt into cookies and everything else? I think this gets very complex where people mm -hmm. need to opt in to different services. So um, you may need different privacy policies for your customer facing public website versus how you're processing someone as once they're customer accessing your portal and your online communications. Uh, and then when you have that, all of those data processing regulations and timeframes um, and whatnot uh, should be carefully reviewed with the legal team and then um, integrated with the cookie management. So a cookie management platform uh, would look at what types of cookies you have and could allow control for the user for what types of cookies they want to employ. Uh, so site functionality cookies could be opted into separately from tracking cookies, for example. Um, but a lot of this is really reliant on the e-privacy directive that's coming out. Uh, it was supposed to come out in conjunction with GDPR, but it's very delayed. I would anticipate more 2019 kind of timeframe, but it has a lot more directive on the types of cookies and the appropriate management thereof. So um, uh, cookies that help functionality would be treated differently under this legislation than tracking cookies, for example. Great, got it. Um, I am seeing a couple questions specific to the Uberflip platform. We will be having a separate webinar walking through all the steps that we're taking for, from our platform on how we're going to address GDPR, so stay tuned for that. I don't want to get too in the weeds um, on our platform specifically today, though. I'm just checking through some more questions coming in. Uh, a lot around consent. Um, I feel like, Michelle, you did a great job covering that, so everyone make sure that you check out Percuto's resources. We'll be sending those after the fact. Yes, we'll be sending that link. Don't worry, guys. I keep getting questions about the GDPR um, white paper from Percuto, so that's great. We'll be sending that. Just while you look through those, um, and it was your remark about lots of questions around con consent. Consent is, you know, clearly front and center of the conversation around GDPR. Um, and it's covered by the the six principles. Um, in, I believe, Article 5, if memory serves me correctly. Um, Article 5 has a second paragraph um, which follows, which talks about the principle of accountability. Um, and for my part, I do feel that this has been overlooked um, because the principle of accountability is that should the worst happen and you, you see legislative scrutiny, um, can you prove that you've done everything you can uh, to uphold the first six principles? Um, and this means having good process, it means having documented process, uh, probably proof that you've trained staff on it and that you can show it's enshrined in your day-to-day -day working practices. Um, I think this is probably the bigger challenge for marketing because this is ongoing. It's a cultural change and probably a cultural challenge. Um, whereas figuring out consent, gathering consent, um, 
you know, is again, it's somewhat subjective, but it's a it's a fairly straightforward thing, and requiring specific things like changes to your landing pages and data storage policies, changing marketing in changing marketing culture into more of a process orientated environment. I think is a much bigger deal for marketing. And I think that's one of the areas we're going to find hardest. I definitely agree with that. There's definitely some mind shift um, that has to take place just to get people in that frame of mind that not everyone wants to hear from you all the time. And that's okay. And as marketers, we have to just make sure that we're sending, as you said, Peter, the right content to the right people at the right time. Um, Just one final question that perhaps both of you could address. Um, We are a global company. Is there a way to reliably identify which of our contacts are in the EU? I'm assuming they mean other than just asking um, on their forms. Um, Well, don't forget, this isn't, um, strictly speaking, this applies to their citizenship. Um, So if you're an EU citizen, uh, then you are covered by this no matter where you live in the world. So I could be an EU citizen, I'm currently uh, perhaps traveling in North America and hit your database. Um, in practice, this becomes very hard because, you know, uh, it's uh, a lot of the time we are using, uh, you know, technology solutions to infer location rather than ask for it. Um, we may get contradictory information on the lead record. Um, and this is an area where I think we, we, we are simply going to have to look more, we're going to have to work harder um, and come to some policy decisions that we rely upon billing country as um, the an indication of citizenship, or perhaps a very conservative environment. You're asking, you could ask explicitly, you know, um, are you an EU citizen? Um, I think we'll see a variety of approaches, uh, but it is specific to the citizen. Uh, not to the company that employs them or uh, where you may currently see them via their IP address. Um, I think it's incumbent on us all to get better about being able to infer and confirm uh, whether they're from the European Union. Definitely. Michelle, anything to add on that one? No, I think you did a great job covering. Great. Well, I think we've gotten through the bulk of the questions. Thank you so much again to Michelle and Peter for your time. We really appreciate your insights. And again, everyone will be sending the recording, so stay tuned for that and feel free to share it around with your colleagues. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Tara. Thanks. Have a great day.